Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Nasser Siabi of Microlink to join us again today. Uh, not only is Nasser a friend and supporter of Access Chat, thank you very much for that. You're keeping us alive and well and, and ticking over uh, in our fifth year now, but, but you're also you know, a very active member of the, the assistive technology community supporting all kinds of inclusion events. So um, great to have you back. You joined us about uh, a year ago to, to give us your personal story, but I think you know, today we're going to have a chat about some of the other exciting things that you're doing, because I know that you've, you've been um, not only working on stuff for the BDF in, uh, Global Task Force, but um, you've got some interesting developments in technology as well that uh, you've been sharing with people. So welcome back, Nessa. Hello, Neil and Deborah and Antonio. It's really nice to be back here. I remember a year ago I said, a sign of making it in life is to be invited to access chat. Well, I did that. But the sign of being in the Hall of Fame is to be invited yeah. the second time. So I am actually privileged. Thank you. And it's a pleasure mm -hmm. to be here. Thank you very much. So um, recently you, 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 you demonstrated um, some captioning tools. Now, obviously, we, 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 um, we're familiar with captioning here. Uh, we, we caption our videos, and we're, we're very lucky to have the support of, of my clear text. But you've also you've, um, you've been working on, on automatic captioning, and you've been working on um, other technology tools as well. So uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of that? Yes, of course. Um... Uh, my, my main passion in, in the world is to find solutions for problems. So, and I like to have more solutions than there are problems. So obviously, captioning is one example where we have a solution where human captioners can do a job, but I know it creates more problems. People can't afford to pay for it sometimes, or it's not practical. So I go after other solutions that don't necessarily have that particular um, barrier. And, and by that, I invest in um, finding, um, let's say, the technology solutions that are far more affordable, far more convenient, but I also want to make sure they work. So um, looking around for the, that kind of, um, uh, particularly for captioning, we've, we looked at several, and there are lots of good ones out there, including the ones that are offered by the likes of Microsoft, Google. And we found there, are, um, there is one in particular that is, is commercially um, driven. It was developed by the US Navy um, paying for it. And it's an amazingly accurate and also a usable platform. Um, so my next task is to actually introduce it where it's appropriate. I've never um, promoted anything that is the only solution out there. But we always give people the option to look at um, the way the kind of a practical difficulties, financial cost, versus a benefit. And this particular one was, has been tested in several different environments. What is amazing in certain circumstances, it doesn't work all the time. And that's the kind of a caveat I always put to people I advise. My work is to advise people who are looking for that solution. Um, um, so this particular captioning uh, has been put into a, a conference for educationalists. It worked amazingly in one room where there was no Wi-Fi, it didn't work so well. So uh, we already know the limitation. Where the microphone is not very good, again, that's another limitation. So human captioners can actually be quite amazing. They can do both. Uh, but the same goes for other solutions we've actually tried lately. We're looking as an alternative to mental health by wearable technology, self-managing. Nothing to do with doctors and pills, all to do with the power of brain managing the condition better. And by having neurofeedback, we've been able to actually see incredible improvement in people's uh, stress, anxiety, and depression just because they feel in control. Now, that's another uh, groundbreaking technology that it's not in the market yet, but we're trialing it just to make sure um, it does work. And if it does work, well, what kind of a person could benefit from it in what kind of an environment? I could name many other technologies we have been trialing over the past few months in anticipation, for example, for the accessibility requirement for public sectors in UK. 
they're all panicking because they they haven't done their homework. The uh, the law now demands they should do it. Before that goes live, I've uh, trialed several um, uh, accessibility tools. I put it in front of our clients. I do get to learn a lot about what doesn't work, but certainly we find that it solves more problems than it actually starts creating problems. So uh, our attitude in life is keep an open mind and always innovate because you never know what's around the corner and what you think works today, next day something better comes out. Hence, we don't attach ourselves to any particular manufacturer or any particular brand. We want what's best for the clients at the most affordable cost and the easiest de uh, deployment. So that's, that's in line with what we've been doing for the past 20, say, seven, 28 years. And, and, and I, uh, just for those that, that don't, uh, don't know you uh, or didn't uh, tune in last time, shame on you. Um, you know, NASA, and, and you, you've been the CEO of Microlink for a long time, and um, Microlink is a, you know, uh, one of the top suppliers of assistive technologies in the UK, and, and I've you know, been within your sort of world um, through working in, in the same space uh, for, for, for quite some time. So we've known each other a long time. Um, and, and yes, absolutely, we have to be platform agnostic when we're looking at this stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's really about solving problems. Deborah, I think you had a question. Yeah, yeah. But go ahead, Nasir, if you want to respond. Go, respond and then I can ask my question. Yeah. What I wanted to actually say, uh, we are quite happy to support brands and products, and we've been very open about that. But we also have to be very honest with them that we are not going to go out of our way and sell something that doesn't actually do what the client wants. So um, on this um, captioning, um, I can, if I'm allowed to give names, it's something called Interactive AS, which is an American company. It not only does captioning, it also accurately does um, translation, live translation on the same platform. Now, I thought maybe English to English is quite easy, or English to French is also doable. But I've actually tried it in Arabic and Persian. These are the two languages I can understand. And it is remarkably accurate. So it's not just a simple tool for transcription. Now I can actually go out and say to my Middle Eastern clients, get another tool. You could actually interact with your workforce who might be um, non-nationals. So, uh, and, and these are really some of the things that we want to do. We brought a lot of products to the market. We made a lot of brands very famous. But when they stop working or something starts working better, we have no problems actually moving on to that one, as we have to, because we have an obligation towards our clients. Nasir, I, I know that you also uh, have come to the United States now, and you're offering your services here in the United States, and, uh, and I think that's great because we actually need the support. I, I will tell you, though, that a lot of U.S. companies get very confused when we're talking about assistive technology, and there's actually some corporations that imply or come right out and say that, you know, assistive technology is dead, it's all being handled by mainstream uh, technology, so you don't need to worry about that old assistive technology, which of course we know that is not true. And I, I think assist, the assistive technology market almost needs to reinvent themselves and help people understand that you are a technology innovation um, part of the organization, it's not going to go away just because it's for people with disabilities. It's almost like you need to rebrand what assistive technology is and means and how it can add value to all these different, you know, corporations and and touch points, educational, employment, all that stuff. And so this one reason why I've always been really fascinated in the work that you're doing. Um, I'm also gonna ask you to repeat the name of that group you just said, only because I didn't get it. So I wanna make sure I look it up. But I think the AT market has the ability to be a lot more innovative and to join these really big technology conversations that are having, that we're having, especially with the AI and the robotics and all that. But it's still, I don't see a lot of um, leaders doing that except you. So and maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. But I, I think 
it almost feels to me like the AT industry needs to reinvent itself. You're right. Um, the reason why um, I'm not going to say we are successful because success can be defined in many ways. But um, uh, Neil knows me and we go back so, so many years. My focus in life is not to dabble in products. I'm always looking for solutions. That's where the difference, the differentiator. There are lots of technologies out there. There are lots of power tools out there. But would you go to the Walmart and buy yourself a very sophisticated power tool and then have your fingers chopped off because you don't know how to operate the machine? You need people to train you. Therefore, what we give to our customers, whether it's education, whether it's operations, whether it's here or in the U.S., we're actually giving them a product with a service wrapper to try to make that product do what they want it to do. So we don't look at, here's what this product does. We say, what is it you're trying to do? And we're giving the correct product, and then we train them how to use that product. That's the differentiator. And the other thing is, why the, maybe it's difficult in the American market um, to promote such an um, offering, because the American market may be having a different culture when it comes to people with disabilities and health condition. You know, they are uh, different to the European culture. But what I know uh, chimes with the American culture is productivity. They love to make the workforce more efficient, more productive. And we have a group of people, maybe one in five of the population, maybe that will increase due to the uh, aging population, that require a different tool. And that tool, is now possible to get from this um, the new advanced assistive technologies, AIs. Again, they're just tools. Without the proper training, without the proper application, they're not going to be any different to what they currently have. So what we do now is to offer those employees who are performing below the, the full potential the ability to examine what they try to do, why they can't do it because of their health, give them that special tool, and then teach them how to use it. And the employer gains a lot more on productivity, absent reduction, and also improvement in engagement. These are the three major factors that is costing employers a lot of money. If we actually look at the case study we did with a major bank in UK, within, um, we've been working with them for 10 years, and they, their attitude was, we want to make our employees more productive and we want them to work better. So you find out why they can't do their job because of their condition, help them to actually get what they can get to get the, the, to do the job. We are, we, we've done that for 10 years. We've demonstrated doing that effectively at the right time. The cost is so low. We're talking about in UK, less than $1,000 per person. We've reduced the long-term absenteeism. Again, law, it was a long-term case study by 80%. We're talking about <clears throat> a group of 1,000 employees. Um, <clears throat> they were monitored before and after, a year after the intervention. The number of days lost due to absenteeism, 12,000 days, a year later was 800 days. That is taking all the other factors like injuries that would have fixed itself, we're talking about 80% reduction. The cost of the whole inter intervention was around um, a third of the benefit by reducing absenteeism if you take average salaries. And that's not even counting the number of people who drop out of employment and you have to recruit and you have to actually have tribunals and legal cases. So we know it's multiple. If I were to promote that message in the U.S. to the corporate U.S. Um, you know, companies and say, well, we're not talking about disability. We're talking about people needing additional help. With this help, at the low cost, very quick, you can get, get a lot more productivity. And I'm sure that will actually work much better than to try to come the angle of there are lots of disabled people and they need your help. Please help them. It, that's how I think my, 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 my message will probably be better received, but we don't know. We have to try that uh, angle as well. No, I, I'm currently looking to the, uh, on, the, on the Apple Store, to the apps, and, and to the area of productivity that you just mentioned. So, and I see here, you know, 
how to stay on schedule, time page, 24 hours assistant, uh, I see Trello, Gmail, I even see Microsoft Word. Okay, so where are the the the, the productivity tool? Shouldn't the productivity tools that you have mentioned should also be here at, at upfront? Because in fact they are more focused on the individual productivity that some of the solutions that are here claiming to be mm. destined to improve your productivity, your own productivity. There is, that's the problem we are in this sector, which doesn't fit into a nice little classification. We sit between health and well-being, productivity, legal compliance, and probably a bit of technology. It's so difficult to have a kind of a campaign based on health and well-being of your workforce. Oh, that's what we've got occupational health people for. That's what we've got doctors and nurses and medication for. I'm doing productivity. Then there are, as you quite rightly said, there are tons of products for productivity. We are looking at somebody who is, um, who's got a condition, whether it's disabled or have long-term condition, and they are unable, for example, to engage in a communication that you and I take for granted. I can't write because I have dyslexia. I can't read because I'm blind. I can't organize myself because Basically, I'm sort of, you know, I'm a really intelligent guy, just can't put ideas on paper. And so on and so forth. I'm, 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 I can't hear, so I, I can't engage in a conversation. There's no caption. So what we do, for every one of those cases, we have a solution. We remove that barrier for them, that communication barrier. We give them the right tool so that they can actually fill that deficit they've got. Meanwhile, they've got other... Um, areas we're very strong at, they can actually um, um, come through and do what they're good at. Uh, taking a dyslexic person, there is there's an agreement across everywhere that I go to that intelligent people, creative people happen to be dyslexic and vice versa. I mean, Neil, uh, that includes you. Now, I'm, I've got lots of people who are not dyslexic and lots of people do the linear jobs they want, uh, we know what they need to do. But I have people who are extremely creative problem solvers, and as it happens, they happen to have that neurodiversity. Would I want to employ that person to do office, office clerical job? No, I don't. As a good employer, as a good manager, I want to use my best people to do the best job. So that tool we give them is appropriate to their deficit. It's not just a generic tool that uh, some of those tools you mentioned could include that to that individual. But we, we bring together a collection of lots of other products out there, which es essentially will remove um, or lower the barriers for them to communicate. Um, I can give lots of examples you've come across. The likes of JAWS makes a blind person do their work on computer without assistance. So they can have a screen reader telling them where they are, what they're doing. You have uh, text help, um, a very good product for literacy. That allows you to, uh, to, to overcome the literacy issues with the reading or writing, spelling, and homophone checking, you name it. And, and the, the, the other product I said, Interactive Streamer, is a perfect tool for a webinar where a, somebody with a hearing loss, it, they may not consider that disability, but they can't engage because they can't hear. If you have this running on the background and you see a subtitle, you know, that's very powerful. That's the kind of productivity I'm talking about. No, I think myself and Neil and Deborah and other people uh, have been talking a lot about uh, applications with captions that allow us to record videos on the go, uh, to share in, in many different places. And we recently see that once you tell people that they can use this app, they can do download them, they actually start to actively using them. And they are out there available on, 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 on the Apple Store and on the Google Store. Uh, People just need to know that they exist, uh, and even if some of them uh, are very popular and even developed by by Apple or by Google, uh, people uh, who are in the tech sector, like we are, they don't seem to know them, and they are the experts. So I think that that makes things even more difficult for non-experts to find this if the experts are the, oh are still getting surprised for the fact that these tools actually exist. 
it's uh, yeah, absolutely true. Uh, the technology is uh, changing every day, and there are far too many things out there. Hence, that's why we're doing very well because we actually find the right solution for that individual. It's not one size fits all. People have different needs, and and, and even those needs may not affect their job. If it does affect their job, then we can actually give them a solution that overcomes that need. Uh, and one of the um, good things about the, the, what we do at the moment is that the technology companies now get it. In the past many years, they kind of ignored this area. Uh, you've seen the Microsoft and Google and the Apple going out fully talking about their assistive technology built in. I love that. It's actually now becoming mainstream. And the more people know about that, as you know in life, you have the basic, you want to improve, you want to get something better. So the more awareness we get uh, from the likes of Microsoft, I, I love their ethos. They are actually going out and promoting it fully. I absolutely, um, uh, you know, 100% support uh, all these companies, and I'm working with them to try to get our early years education to embrace assistive technology. Like what will a enable individual children to become more independent. If we can get that uh, formula right, and if we can get awareness raised, then we get a lot less problems with the education, schools, and children dropping out. We get a lot less problem people de developing a lack of confidence and, mm -hmm. and mental health issues. So I think this is, uh, this is for the technology for good. It's empowering, and certainly it's going to make life a lot more productive and more efficient for a lot of people. I, I Nasir, fully agree. Yeah, I, I, I agree as well. Uh, Nasir, uh, um, a situation that we see here in the United States, but of course this is not just a U.S. problem. This is a problem all over the world. Um, we see um, every day this year and for the next few years to come in the United States, 10,000 Americans turn 65 years old every yeah. single day, and it's going to go on for years. And yeah. one thing that I'm seeing, and I've been trying to address this market and others like Excel Lebois has been very, um, showed great leadership in this, but one thing that I'm seeing is that as people are aging and acquiring disabilities, especially over a certain age, I, I, I don't know what age it happens because I, I think there's a lot of factors, but let's say it happens around 55. It seems like most of the conversations that are happening are helping people with disabilities, children and young adults with disabilities be included in society and education. But when people acquire these disabilities, which are happening, you know, in over 60, 46% of the uh, population, um, according to our AARP, which is the American Association of Retired Persons, um, what we see is those people are not getting access to assistive technology they don't know that they have assistive technology. Sort of the point that Antonio was making that he goes out to the Apple store and does a search and none of these come in, none of these resources. Yeah. And so I see um, a lot, large parts of the population that are still in the workforce too. We had yeah. um, uh, Antonio invited uh, the president of Siemens to be on and he was talking about having five generations in the workforce, which I know Neil said Atos is that way. And so these people are still trying to work and yet they're losing their hearing, they're losing their sight, they're losing mobility, they're becoming wheelchair users for the first time in their lives and they are not being introduced to the accommodations or the adaptions as you all call them. Uh, I see it as a huge issue and the two groups are not talking together. Together. So it's, um, I know that when, I'll give you one quick point. My, um, my father-in-law lost his hearing in, in his late 80s. And so even though I'm, air quotes, supposedly an expert in this, I mean, for a while, it's like we couldn't communicate with him. And my husband has lost a lot of his hearing, and of course he has dementia too. Um, and so th this is a huge problem that's happening all over the world. And I was just curious. Yeah how your company was addressing this, how can, you can help uh, employers address this in the markets you're working in, and I know these are big questions I'm asking, but I thought it might be. Well, well it's one. actually a good question. A very good question, right? and, 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 and you're absolutely right. Um, the aging population is a worry for planners, for the governments. How do we keep these people at, at work longer? Because, you know, uh, economically, people are not doing so well. 
So they have to force to stay apart from the health issue. Uh, it's a necessity. They have to earn money. Um, so, but you know, the exciting thing is that assistive technology, what you and I consider voice recognition, is becoming mainstream. My three-year-old niece now can talk to Google. Say, okay, Google, play me a song. You know, it's that, that's amazing. And you can use the same thing for someone who is paraplegic to tell um, to um, Alexa, close the curtain, switch on the light, do this, do that. And you can go to the extent that people with complete paralysis, but they can use their eyes to control. So you have eye gaze technology. You can do all sorts of functions attached to your device that you can uh, control the environment. So. So I think whilst the numbers of people with disabilities are uh, increasing, their exposure to technology is becoming far more widespread, and you have more elderly people joining Facebook than the younger people, because they use that as a communication with their loved ones. And by using Facebook, then you find that other technologies, they start learning, like voice on Siri do a search rather than types. So I think these are the things that will creep into our everyday life and people will take it for granted. I'm hoping there'll be a time that my services are only needed by that 5-10% of the population who really need something special. I'm not out there to make this a mainstream so I make a lot of money. I really do want everyone to have access to what you and I take for granted employment, education, and welfare. And by can, because technology is now cheap and free in a way for a lot of people, I'd like to actually still have that ability to give that very hard to reach, very difficult ones, the, the solutions that it's not included in what you and I will find on an operating system or in your, your, your Apple iPhones or, or whatever else that you, you carry around. So uh, I, I'm quite excited that the elderly are engaging with the technology and more awareness in the corporate world. And um, Neil will tell you, once the IT people become more confident, they'll stop people actually using them, um, uh, like blocking the usage. You know, I have still got companies who won't let anyone to try to do the um, text to speech or uh, or use some of the um, captioning or voice recognition because it's not in the standard build. Right. And once that and I'll tell you another, to, and, and another thing we see, I'm going to say this briefly and then turn it over to Neil, but there is uh, there's a situation happening in one of our states, one of our largest our largest state, which is California, where a um, a legislator has um, said that they're going to change the way we're doing voice technology, like the Alexas and the Googles. And what they're recommending doing uh, would actually stop uh, some of these providers like Amazon from selling Alexa in California. That would be so detrimental to our community. Uh, so they've yeah. actually invited us to write a position paper and get people with disabilities at the courthouse. But there's some dangers as they're trying to protect everybody, and I get it, the voice recognition, you know, somebody could record my voice and then order a bunch of stuff from Alexa. But I think the risk of that are so low when it compares to how people with disabilities are using these voice technologies. So I don't want to take this too far off, but I just want to say there, we're seeing that happening right now in California. They're going to vote on it on Tuesday, and um, I'm going to get out and talk about it on social media and get people with disabilities at that courthouse. So if you're in Sacramento, con yeah. contact me. <laughs> well, I, I think you will find that people go slightly overboard and go crazy because they can't actually control the environment. It's security issues sorted out instead of, it's just like saying, we know it's good, but because we really are worried about the security aspect, which we don't know what to do about, you can't use it. Well, everything else in life can apply. Don't use knives because it's dangerous. And uh, don't use fire, fire because you can settle it. Yeah, yeah. So that's the problem that the legislators and governments will have to sort out. They are playing catch up. That's the difficulty. Technology is actually leaving them behind. And in order to respond, they go back to their old tested method of block, stop people doing it, rather than actually let's, let's fix the problem. 
But yeah, I, I, I know there's danger with voice recognition, with this, all this AI stuff that they can learn about your life. But then, you know, we've given that away for a long time. It's too late. The gene is out of the bottle. Let's deal with it, but make sure we make it safer. I, I think, you know, obviously, we don't want to stop people using services. And, and um, without this becoming an advert for Alexa, actually, whilst we were in the US, there, uh, Amazon's uh, accessibility lead was showing me um, an internet connected microwave. I never thought I would be singing the praises of an internet connected microwave. However, um, actually, you can see how uh, being able to tell the you know the microwave to to do something um, is going to help so many people with sort of mobility issues and cognitive issues. Um, you know. I, I, I was talking with them and I was saying, now, if you can just um, add a scale in there, you'll be able to prevent you know, hundreds of thousands of food poisoning cases because you'll be able to accurately work out how long you're going to cook something. So you can you know, put the, the raw chicken in and go, you know, microwave, cook my chicken. It'll know that it's chicken. It'll know the weight of it. And away you go. Uh, and you don't end up with it being being raw, um, you know things like that. That that you you know, I watch people that are not old, that are not you know that that have no documented cognitive uh, or neurodiverse conditions, going up to a a, a, a three hundred and fifty pound microwave, and not using any of the features other than pressing the 30 second button six times because it's the easiest way of, of getting the thing to function. You just described a student, a university student, okay? That's <laughs> yeah. good enough. Uh, anyway, if you have intelligent microwaves, that, is that trash you're going to eat again? You've had that four times in four days. <laughs> um, yes, I, I like that kind of a concept. But you, you know, uh, 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 yeah, and then and then it will say, "I won't eat your food," but something yeah, else yeah. inside. <laughs> sure, no, ab ab absolutely. But but uh, yeah, we can talk about health and and, and, and our Western diets. <laughs> that's that's a whole yeah. other show. The most exciting work I'm involved in at the moment, and that's um, letting out the secret, is is social housing because. Every country in the world, with the aging population, with people who are unwell, they need to be catered for in accommodation. Now, I'm working with a lot of construction companies, with government um, um, lawmakers, to try to make it mandatory that assistive technology goes into build accommodation from now on. And not only because it will help the quality of life. If somebody wants to live independently, doesn't want to go to a care home, doesn't want to live in a senior's home, they want to stay in their own home, just imagine the kind of technology with the Alexa, with the kind of a, um, you know, monitoring systems. If that person is in trouble, immediately the system will recognize that individual hasn't left the bedroom this morning, I need to alert the family or the carer. It's easily done, very cheap to do when you are building a house. It's getting a lot of um, positive response. I'm already um, talking to two construction companies who want to do pilots in four local authorities in UK. And also I've met with a, a government as well as a shadow government there to try to build that into potentially some sort of a procurement requirement for all construction companies to be able to build that into the housing in accommodation. Now, the obvious... Um, um, flip side of that, the world is moving towards flexible working, agile working, working from home. Mm -hmm. Now, if I've got somebody who is disabled and has all the technology they need to, to, to do independent living, you know, that's an also access to employment. You know, you don't, you don't need Absolutely. to go to the city. So we can actually dial in to a call center from my comfort of my own house. I'm a wheelchair user, I don't need to, but I have everything I need in order to operate as a call center operator in my own house. If I have a real severe physical condition or if I have mental health condition, I don't want to leave home, I have phobia leaving home, or I have insomnia, I can't sleep during the night. You know, I'm a perfect person to answer questions, solve problems, customer service over the phone from my house and get paid for it. 
Yeah. Or you can so, only do that if you build that environment right now. So I'm, I'm super interested in this, and um, yeah, uh, we we as an organization do quite a lot in the sort of smart cities, IoT space. Um, and I've been lobbying for a long time that you know, this has huge potential uh, to be inclusive and, and, and everything else. One of the issues that we know that we have in in this and other technologies is the, the, the whole sort of thing about interoperability. And when you're building stuff into the built environment, what, when you say, your, you want to build AT in, into new builds. Are you talking, you know, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the, the, the basic wiring to enable it, you know, the, the sort of the, the microphones or, or stuff like that? Or are you talking about voice enabling stuff? What exactly? Are you well, these are, these are, these are, these are open ended. It depends on the person mm -hmm. you're trying to. So I, I was uh, advising one local authority the module and they said okay we've got this eight units we want to build that and what would you say the first I looked at it I said none of them are suitable for for people with physical disabilities he said why I said look at the you need a wheelchair in there how are you going to do it oh that's true and then another thing in the kitchen you know you have nice tables laid out I said if I was a blind person or somebody on a wheelchair I'll never want the sharp corners on the design of your tables. That's a good point. So, you know, these are basic. If I was like, let's say I had um, autism, I would like the room to be in a particular way, or if I had migraine. These are very basic design architecture. In addition to that, wire up the place to a, f a fast internet, super um, speed internet, then put those microphones wired in. Uh, instead of having Alexa working from your kitchen, why can't you have a distributed microphones and then going into one box and does what Alexa does, which is easily done, but you have to wire it up. And they okay. kind of said, um, sorry about the background noise, it's, uh, it's the ice cream. I want ice cream. Uh, uh, I was going to say, it sounds like ice cream. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we've, got a, we've got an Italian guy with a passion for ice cream comes here every day. Anyway, I got um, this, um, I got uh, digressed here. But no, it's actually building those infrastructures, which we know is easy to do, wired up to begin with, and then add additional features based on the type of a person you're trying to help. Okay. And one of those was, I want to build a fire alarm system, a, a doorbell system for someone who is deaf. How difficult is that to do that when you're building the house? Another few pounds or few dollars, instead of later on getting an electrician and somebody to come and fit it. And the cost of all this could be extremely low if they do this on a, on a, on a large scale. And yes. they just think it is doable. And in fact, that's what they're taking this very seriously. We've done, um, I have a young, very talented young guy who's um, himself got um, cerebral palsy. He's a very bright guy. We took him as an apprenticeship um, employee. And I said to him, I've got this requirement. Can you go away and just come back with some recommendations for different types of disabilities, what technologies are needed? Within about two months, he gave me a 60-page report, exactly what you need for somebody who is blind, leading up to the house, the type of a doorbell and or, you know security logs. When you go inside the house, the shower room, the kitchens, you know, make it tactile. And then the same goes for autistic, the same goes for people with, um, you know, um, mobility. That is what I submitted to, the, to these builders. And they just said, this is amazing. Now we get the architects to look at that and see which one can be built in, which one needs to be an additional option. You know, it doesn't cost a lot of money. It's just a different way of thinking. But we have to do that now because of the aging population. Now, uh, I have a, a discussion with a group here in, in Cork a, a, f a few weeks ago about social housing and, and, and they were telling me that when, when the government is building houses for them, you know, someone in a wheelchair, uh, as, an, as an example, they only, uh, they build a house and then they go, oh, what are your needs? And then they, yes. need, and then they go there and then they, need, they spend more money adjusting the house for the needs of this person, instead of doing that while they are building a house, and they were they were they were explaining explaining their frustration. Well, we want 
to move to the house as soon as we can, and we can't because they need to wait for our feedback. Uh, and in fact, our needs are increasing the cost of the house with not, and that's not needed. They could just have okay. built it like that. And they were really frustrated with the fact that they are not included from the beginning when they are discussing yeah. the build of the house for the needs. So that's a, so that's why what you just captured it's it's very interesting and, 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 and I would really relate with the situation that is happening here in Ireland. But, but it is happening everywhere and, and sadly it's uh, disability has been a uh, fringe activity but it's becoming more and more um, mainstream and hence they have to do it. They have to do it differently. And as I said, this idea of connecting, the connectivity for disabled people with the outside world, we know how powerful that is. You know, um, the deaf people are liberated because of mobile phones. Blind people were liberated by iPhone. And now we need to do the same for people who are occasionally, unfortunately, being on the low socioeconomical um, spectrum end up in houses which are really very difficult to live in even without the condition. So what we need to now do is say additional thinking about how it should be designed. In addition to that, we need to also say, well, it will save us money long term. Also, we bring in millions of disabled people into employment. Just imagine they're out of reach from employment what we can actually make, make, bring them back because we've given them all the tools they need in order to, to do the job that everybody else can do. Um, but that, that, is, that is really exciting and I think um, I'm getting quite a lot of traction and certainly I've got one major Irish um, building construction company called Extra Space. They are modular house building. They've taken this uh, very seriously and they want to do this on several of their projects. That sounds, that sounds really exciting and i'm sure i want to talk to you more about that um thank you very much nasser it's been great talking to you as always need to thank you know, our other um supporters aside from microlink which are barclays access and my clear text thank you all uh, we we really appreciate your continued support uh we really look forward to you joining us on twitter on tuesday night i know it'll be a it'll be an interesting chat thank you once again Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure again. Thank you.